can I go? Okay. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. I'm Simone Cavallaro, director of the Stigler Center. We are delighted to host Chris Hughes for a conversation with Professor Zingales. Please know that we are on the record and live streaming. As usual, views expressed by our guests are their own, not those of the Stigler Center or the University of Chicago. As you may know, the Stigler Center promotes and diffuses research on regulatory capture and the distortions that special interest group impose on capitalism. We have many initiatives, including the Capitalism Podcast, co-hosted by Kate Waldock and Luigi. The flash drive that uh, you received this morning uh, is preloaded with all the episodes. Uh, so if you want to give it a try, please feel free. Uh, please also consider adding ProMarket, our blog, to your reading list, given your interest in topics like antitrust and competition. We look forward to the conversation tonight, but before we start, allow me to briefly introduce the, our speakers. Chris Hughes is the co-chair of the Economic Security Project, a nonprofit working on creating equity through cash assistance and guaranteed income programs. He's also a senior advisor at the Roosevelt Institute. In 2018, he published his first book, First Shot, Rethinking Inequality and How We Earn. Before we began, began his work on economic issues, Chris co-founded Facebook as a student at Harvard and later led Barack Obama's digital presidential campaign. He was also the owner and publisher of The New Republic from 2012 to 2016. As you probably know by now, he recently worked, wrote up an opinion piece for the New York Times entitled, It's Time to Break Up Facebook. Luigi Zingales is a Robert McCormack Professor of Finance and the Charles Harper Faculty Fellow at Chicago Booth. He's also the Faculty Director of the Stigler Center. His research and interests span from corporate governance to financial development, and from political economy to the economic, uh, economic effect of culture, among others. He has also written several books, and he appears frequently in the media. And now, please join me in welcoming our speakers. So, Chris, first of all, welcome uh, to Chicago. Welcome to, to Booth. Uh, you, you seem to have skipped uh, the MBA and done pretty well without it. Well, <laughs> this is true. It's so nice that, that, you're not an ad for this call, but uh, we're here to discuss something else. So. Um, I'm uh, curious to know, when you started uh, in the Harvard Dome uh, Facebook with uh, uh, Zuckerberg, what was your vision of Facebook? What, what did you want it to be? Well, um, first off, I just want to say thank you uh, for, to you and uh, to the business school for having me and for asking me to join this conference. This was uh, a conference I knew was happening, was hoping to make it to, but um, given I published this somewhat small article on Thursday of last week, the world exploded. And so it's really nice of you guys to make time for, um, for me. And I'm flattered to be in a room like this with so many experts. Although there are many of you I, over here I can't really see. So um, <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll shift a little forward. So anyway, thank you. It's also nice to be back in Chicago. The, I, most of you guys probably know this from living here. But I worked across the street of, on the first Obama campaign for two years, so I can see my office from out here. So um, I was walking briefly during a call and feel very nostalgic. I just, it's a, it's a happy place. Um, so what were we thinking when we started Facebook? Um, we, we started Facebook in February of 2004. And uh, just to set the scene, uh, you know, Mark and I had gotten to know each other a little bit freshman year, as I've talked a, a bit about. We weren't particularly close friends, but uh, we shared a lot of friends in common. We decided to be roommates sophomore year. We were paired with a couple other people. And then in our, our dorm room, uh, we all came from different backgrounds. I was studying history and literature. Mark was studying computer science, but had spent time in the classics and psychology. Our, Third co-founder, Dustin Moskovitz, was studying economics. And we were constantly just throwing stuff at the wall. You know, Facebook was the third of a series of projects that we were just sort of spinning up and seeing how it would work. So the initial vision wasn't particularly grand. It, we, social networks were growing on the internet. It was that moment in 2004 where before that it had been sort of awkward to share information about yourself online. I think 
probably most people in this room remember it, but it was like, you know, why would you share something publicly? Are you looking for a date? You know, are you, what's, what's, the, what's the deal? And it was at that moment when everybody started sharing something. So with Facebook, we took a different tack than Friendster and some of the other sites out there and made it private by default, to just to your community, and also tied it to real life identities. And those two innovations, um, I think, were real, were huge drivers of our initial, initial growth and the focus on the college community. So the, I, to, it's, it's a long way of saying our vision was not to wire the world or whatever the, the phrase that, that Mark is using now. It was much more prosaic. It was connecting people at Harvard with one another and helping them stay in touch. Now, a lot of those values, it turns out, are you know have driven Facebook's growth since. But um, it was a project that we were trying out, and uh, little by little became the company that it is today. But it's interesting because you mentioned that uh, you were very concerned about the privacy of the people uh, participating to your network, and. Uh, well. No, I didn't think we were t very concerned about the privacy. I think the insight that we had was that uh, people wanted to share information about themselves. They wanted to be themselves online. And at that moment, the choice was really share it with everybody, which made a lot of people uncomfortable. Or it, could we make it possible for people to share by default just with real people who they knew in their real community. So there weren't robust, pri I, don't, I want to be clear, there weren't robust privacy settings right off the bat. Instead, it was about um, moving from an era of open fic fictions, if you will, to the real world identities and uh, real world community. But at the time, the incumbent was MySpace. Not quite yet. It was Friendster in 2004, but quickly after, yeah, in, in five and six. 2005 and 2006, MySpace was the breakout. Yeah. And, and MySpace was uh, more cavalier than you were with a privacy setting or not? MySpace was a place you went to, you know, invent, invent an identity. You know, some people would, would tie it closely to themselves, but, you know, there were, there was, it was chaos. <laughs> there were flashing lights, there were decals, there were, colors everywhere, there were photos, there was no, it was just felt sort of like the Wild West. And that served a market need, but I think that, um, you know, Facebook, by contrast, was streamlined, simple, uh, you know, and, and again, tied to these identities, and, and, I, and more people, people voted with their eyeballs, people voted with their feet, like they cannot do today, because there isn't competition. I have a feeling that's where we're going, but I think that, you know, it was at that moment a competitive landscape. There was MySpace, there was Friendster, there was uh, Tumblr, LiveJournal, uh, Facebook, um, there was a high school, you know, there, were, there was robust competition. No, but that's exactly what I was going, because there is uh, Dina Srinathan, who is here, who wrote this uh, piece saying that uh, when Facebook was facing competition, was actually much more concerned about privacy and trying to give an alternative to what was there. Uh, there was uh, MySpace. And uh, once it became the incumbent and a very entrenched one, then started to put uh, all the cookies that start to surveil you even when you deregister from Facebook, etc. Is that a reasonable narrative or this is one uh, that we academics invent but uh, there is no base for it? Well, I, I mean, I understand that narrative, and I, I mean, I left the company in 2007 to go to move across the street and to work on the Obama campaign, so I wasn't, she talks a lot, I think, in her research, as I've read it, about the 2013-14 period mm -hmm. and when, um, and, and, and transitions then, so I, I honestly don't know. If it was, um, okay, we're the king of the hill now, we can do anything. I mean, my sense is that prob it probably wasn't that cavalier, that intentional, but I think that what is more likely is that when you have a market that's effectively frozen, when Facebook faces no competition, no meaningful competition in the social networking landscape, you... Take what you can get. You, you, if, if that means that you can, 
you know, demand more from users on privacy, you have more leverage. You're the only option in town. So I don't, I, I doubt that there was like some meeting one day where they decided we're going to go in this particular direction. But I, I think that the general arc of, um, of uh, her arguments and some of the other arguments and, and the, the timeline of the evolution of, of attitudes towards privacy, that, that I understand. But so you left Facebook to come and work for Obama. Uh, was uh, thought as a temporary sabbatical or that was from the beginning you decided to abandon Facebook to move to a new life? Uh, it was temporary at the beginning, but it was, I mean, I left, I, I left the company and moved here, but it was, um, you know, I was like 23, 24, um, and really excited about Obama and um, wanted to work for him. And so I, I felt like I could go back to the company if I wanted to or needed to and um, never did. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a decision that I made, not particularly practically. People. I was a little crazy at the time. You know, Facebook's growth was taking off. And a lot of the people even then at Facebook really felt like it was a mission to wire the world. And that connection was good in and of itself. And that this was progress. And I, I personally never, I mean, I enjoyed working at the company. I'm, I'm proud of the work that we did. I have s some misgivings about some things that we did. But I didn't feel, my point is I didn't really feel a missionary zeal about it in the same way that I did for, and continue to now about politics and, and political issues in general. So then it was about Obama and now it's uh, about a larger set of economic justice issues. So um, I don't think it was a, sh a shock when I left in the sense that like Chris was always a little different <laughs> than the others, but I think it was still surprising because the company was in its like, you know, upward swing, the hockey, you know, the hockey stick was just beginning um, to have that inflection moment. And did you work also for the 2012 campaign or not? No. Okay. So you don't know uh, to what extent uh, Obama was using some uh, profiling that then became infamous when uh, Cambridge Analytica well, did, but uh, uh, they were used also in the Obama campaign or not? Which w was what used? Uh, in sense, there are two aspects of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. One is that the data was misappropriated. Yes. Okay, that's important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but a lot of people resent just the, the level of profiling and micro-targeting, et cetera. Oh, the Obama, I mean, folks in politics do all kinds of micro-targeting. I'm sure, you know, I wasn't part of the 12 campaign, um, but I'm sure that they were looking for folks who had come to the Obama website to serve them ads because they're more likely to give uh, to donate, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, I think that happens on the left and the right now, so. But so, you divested from Facebook in 2012. 12. And the what, uh, what made you to divest from Facebook? Risk aversion. <laughs> it, so wasn't, it wasn't, I had no, I can't, no, I can't okay. claim any, um, no. No, I grew up, um, I grew up in a small town, North Carolina, Hickory, North Carolina, and was on, I was a scholarship kid at a fancy boarding school and at Harvard, and that's partially why I didn't drop out of Harvard when Mark and Dustin did. And my mom was a public school teacher, dad was a traveling paper salesman. We were, you know, solidly middle class. I don't want to, this is, um, but I had, ne no one in our, in our family had ever gone to a place like Harvard, so I didn't drop out. And then later, you know, it was, in, it is, more money than I could have ever dreamed of making. And so Facebook went public in June of 2012. If you remember, it took a, uh, quite a dip because everyone was freaking out of, about whether the company would be able to adapt to mobile. And then at the end of the year, it rebounded close to the IPO price. And there was a six-month lockup. And you know I faced this decision because I didn't have any emotional like r real investment in the company in a way that a lot of folks do. It was just sort of, why, I mean, I have half a billion dollars that's coming out of this. Like, w I'm staying in to roll the dice, to like make an extra 50 million, 100? I mean, like, I know people do that, but that is not how I work. Like, it was so, I mean, it's so 
was so much money and um, was so, I, I would take the stability over the unpredictability any day of the week. So my husband and I made a commitment a little while after that to give away the, effectively all of the wealth over the course of our lifetimes. And um, you know, that's what we're working on now. That's what we do today. That's a nice work to do. <laughs> yes. No, but uh, I actually, I always tell my students that uh, uh, the extra million that you make or extra billion that you make is, is not as uh, good as the half a billion you can lose and we go get down to zero. And, uh, yeah. uh, over well, it turned out to be the wrong, <laughs> the wrong decision from a, some economic theory, but it was the right decision for me. Uh, yeah. But, so when did you start to have then some misgiving about Facebook? I was sort of late, I'm embarrassed to admit. Um, the summer of 2016. You know, um, Donald Trump was rising, and it's always, it's always unclear, I think, with social networks in particular, how much they just reflect who we already are, and how much they exacerbate who we are. So in other words, like way back in the beginning, it was with your favorite movies or that one photo that you wanted to put up when you only had a choice of one, you know, was the vanity, that the hours that people would spend doing that, was that just who we are and now Facebook was showing that to us? Or were we actually creating more time, effectively more time in that vanity? And um, that, that's, that was confusing to me, at least. Um, I think it's unfortunately likely that these products are creating more of that self-consciousness and vanity. And of course, there's some mental health studies that suggest that's um, true now. So similarly in 2016, same kind of question, you know, is the anger, the populism, the, the, the nationalism, the, the uh, racism that was cropping up, is that just reflecting America as we've always been and it's percolating up now and we can just see it? Or is the fact that somewhat extreme voices or very extreme voices have a larger platform and can organize on them faster actually changing the nature of our politics? And I began to drift in that period from the first to the second. Like this is, Facebook I don't, I wanna be clear, is not the cause of the rise of, of Donald Trump or nationalist leaders across the world. There are economic justice reasons, there, uh, there are um, uh, racism, there are, there are many causes for, uh, for it, but I do think that it played a role. So that's when I first started becoming much more uncomfortable with what was happening on the platform than certainly after the fake news fallout and the really cavalier response that Mark had. Well, there's no way that we could have had a, an effect on this. Um, that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, including me. And then as the analysis of that continued and then falling into the Cambridge Analytica scandal and then every single, I, I was gonna say week, but it feels all like almost daily now but every single week that there's a new thing, a new headline about some privacy abuse or, or misstep, um, it's just added up to me. It's just become too much. And I think the company is um, unaccountable. I think Mark is unaccountable to, as I said in the piece, to shareholders, to his users, to government in a lot of ways, although we can change that. But, um, and that unaccountability is corrosive. I think it's what's driving, um, the problem is it's not a coincidence. It's not because the media is out to get Facebook that this, that this keeps happening. I think it's actually something structurally baked into the market. Now, you have uh, witnessed the conference today and witnessed that uh, we are struggling with defining what we call in economics consumer harm. Now, you're not an economist, I understand, but from your I point- am in a, <laughs> I am taking some classes in economics. One day, maybe, I can be like Luigi. But uh, in your sort of, uh, perspective, if you were to explain to a broader set of people, uh, what is the consumer harm of Facebook? Certainly, a lot of people enjoy Facebook. There's sort of a lot of, uh, as uh, Tyler said today, a lot of consumer surplus generated by Facebook. But uh, uh, what is the consumer harm, if any? I think there are quite a few. I think um, the most prominent one is um, well, I should say, before I answer that, I should take a step back and say, I, I think that 
before we even get into a conversation about harm, we should start a conversation about these issues with competition. Mm -hmm. I, I do believe that that's where the, con the, the conversation should start because I think that no person in America sh uh, should have as much power mm -hmm. as Mark Zuckerberg has and a competitive market along with government regulation and oversight is the way to, to balance that power out. So that, that, that's my top line argument, which I know sits not always great with a lot of um, economists, perhaps more with um, uh, political science folks, but I think that there's, I'm, I'm with Tim Wu in that school and believing that there's a history here of that we need to recover to make that um, connection clear and to talk about antitrust and, and oversight in the context of um, competition and power. That said, I also think that there is very clear identif identifiable consumer harm. I think that a lot of, uh, whether it's Cambridge Analytica or the more recent um, uh, privacy missteps, I mean, three weeks ago it was millions more Facebook passwords stored in plain text format, which, you know, Facebook says, well, we don't think any of our employees access them. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's sloppy. It, and by the way, how do we even know to trust that? Um, I mean, the, the, even the WhatsApp uh, breakdown was not a, that, that I read about this morning, was that just this morning, yesterday, uh, I, I think was, um, was another secure, security vulnerability that was particularly scary. You didn't even have to, all you had to have was just the app on your phone. Um, and so, and I, and I worry that for every one of these things that we hear about, there are another nine that we don't necessarily um, hear about. So I think that there is a breakdown in security and trust for consumers that is a real cost. I also think that there's a cost in the freeze on the market and innovation. You know, we have not seen another major social networking company started in eight years. Snapchat was started eight years ago, 2011. And its revenues last year were a billion dollars compared to Facebook's 56 billion. I mean, it is tiny. It is a rounding error, and it is an excuse for Facebook to say, no, no, there's competition. We promise, even though by any way you measure it, whether it's attention minutes or revenue in the social networking sector, the HHI index, any way you do it, it's, it's, it, it, there, there is not. And these claims, some of which I heard today, about Gmail chat, <laughs> um, I think that's, that's hard for me to get there. But, but you know, even Facebook, since the piece came out, they were like, no, no, Chris is, Chris is not right. It's YouTube. I mean, that's what they lead off with, as YouTube is the competitor to Facebook, which um, is, non, is, is difficult, I think. And I think most, yeah, I think you don't need me. I think most American, wh whether you're a teenager or, you know, in the late years of life, would know that, like, YouTube is a different product for different services than, than Facebook. So, to the, to the consumer harm, I think that privacy and security, and I think um, uh, the cost of a frozen market and the lack of, of um, innovation. And the one other thing I'll, I'll say on this is because the social networking space is so locked down, there is this enduring illusion of choice, which is great for Facebook. I mean, it is not clear that, that Americans, at least, let alone, I was inspired by some of the comments talking about the international landscape, that, that folks internationally understand that Instagram and WhatsApp are owned by Facebook and that their data is being consolidated across the three. So, and, and uh, you know, people say, think, I'm just, I've, I'm done with Facebook. I'm so frustrated with it. I'm going to move to Instagram. <laughs> right. And like, you, you know, so, um, and I think that that's, I think that's a real, I think that's a real problem. And I think that the lack of, of innovation in this space is harming consumers in addition to um, the privacy costs. The, the, there, there's, nowhere, there's nowhere else to go. But I love your uh, attention to our competition. And uh, one question is, um, are there other ways to reach the same result in the sense that uh, instead of breaking up Facebook, you might think about uh, uh, trying to open it up to make uh, the social graph portable. Yeah. Uh, what well, do you think about these, al these alternatives? Uh, well, in the piece, I, so I, I think that one of the things that, um, you know, breaking up Facebook is obviously um, an audacious thing to talk about. I think it's necessary and important, but the bigness of that idea 
uh, has overshadowed some of the other things that I talked about in the piece and that I think a lot of other folks in this room are working on. And so I, I don't think that breakup alone is enough. You know, it's not clear to me that just breaking up Facebook is going to solve our, our privacy concerns. Uh, in fact, I, d I don't think that's right. But nor do I think that just regulation will really create the accountability that a competitive market requires. So in my journey of researching, talking to a lot of people, writing this piece, I really, you know, learned and came to believe and have come to believe that you got to do both. You got to think about real competition and when I say break up, I mean specifically unwind the WhatsApp and Instagram mergers and I think you need to create something along the lines of what Jason Furman was talking about in the UK context, a digital uh, agency that is in charge, that is charged with implementing um, uh, privacy protections and uh, privacy awareness in addition to interoperability, enabling people to move with their social graph and potentially uh, with uh, their data. And I think moving speech decisions out of Menlo Park and into the courts, um, which you know an agency could play some role in that. I, I, um, I think that that deserves further, further scrutiny and, and development, but I think that that's, um, that, is, uh, that is a solution. So I think, we, I think we need to do both of these things. Could that agency be a part of the FTC? Maybe, I don't know. Um, should it be independent? I like, the, I, I, I like the idea of an independent agency. We do it for airlines. We do it for pharmaceuticals. We do it for the financial industry. Good Lord, I mean, digital, you know, social networking, digital, these things are, uh, you know, as important to us. Why wouldn't, why, why is it, why wouldn't we do the same thing for these platforms? I was smiling because we don't think that they work particularly well. The airlines, the, the financial industry, the, the, the record of the agency is far well, the from agen perfect. Well, but the agencies here, no, I want to be clear, the agencies are protecting consumer safety and security. Airlines are charged with. Well, the airlines in the United protection. States are safer yeah, now than they've so been sure. at any point in their but history. So I'm not saying that the agency would necessarily be charged with the, comp uh, the, the competition responsibilities, what the FTC and the Department of Justice have historically done. But they, they I, I think, should be charged with setting a baseline, a guarantee of a certain quality and security of service, which we do do with the pharmaceutical companies. We do do with airlines. Yeah, but... Uh just to play the devil's advocate, Please. I agree with you, but just to play with the devil's advocate, we know that so now the FAA delegated some responsibility to Boeing with not great results. Uh, we know that uh, in the financial sure. industry there is a lot of uh, revolving doors, so very often the, the regulators are actually acting in the interest of the regulated rather than in the interest of the public at large. Uh, the FDA does not have a phenomenal record in terms of approving drugs. They tend to be very slow and they tend to approve drugs that they don't add any value uh, to the consumers. They're, so they are testing, the tests are very expensive and not particularly effective. So uh, any, why should we hope that uh, this agency will be different to some extent? Well, I think you and I might just diverge ideologically <laughs> on, uh, on this point, but I think that the alternative is some kind of voluntary, not, voluntary commission that doesn't have the force of law, doesn't have any accountability, and that I don't trust. So we, we can talk about, and we should talk about, how government, when government fails, how these agencies should be improved. I'm with you. I think that we should not be blinded to the fact that government is often, these agencies are often very successful and do a lot of good in the world. We've got 30 years of Chicago School of Economics telling us that markets have the solutions, government's the problem. I'm of a different school. I think that government can often play a, co a constructive, positive force in the world, including at these agencies. And I think that if it's not government charged with this, it is, it's, it's voluntary, you know, just hoping that Mark Zuckerberg's a good guy. I do think he's a good guy, but I also think that he has too much power. You know, it's just sort of hoping for, you know, um, uh, the private sector folks to self-regulate, and um, that isn't, that's not the kind of America that I want to live in. So yesterday, Matt Stoller had this great line that, uh, paraphrasing Reagan, said the, the worst sentence in the English language is, I'm Comcast and I'm here to help. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love Stoller. I'm looking for him. <laughs> and then you can say, I'm like uh, Facebook and I'm here to help. But we talk so much about Facebook. What about Google? You want to break up Google too? Well, I know less about Google. And I'm less, um, I'm less clear on the competition. Um, uh, you know, on the arguments on both sides on competition and on consumer harm. So I, I think that, you know, I am concerned about um, some of the conversations that have happened historically around Yelp, concerned about some competition and mapping. I've had some conversations with people on both sides of this in this, in this room, and I'm still in a learning phase for a lot of these companies. I think, um, you know, I, I think in general we should be asking that question. I think that's a productive, healthy question to ask. I think it, you know, is the kind of one that reminds us that we have that power and that uh, that's a that's a good thing. Um, so I'd love to I'd love to learn more to 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 come up with a nice solid answer for you in a in a, in a month or two. So Hal Vian, this is for you. He's coming. It's just I'm, a question of time. I've talked to him. But I've eventually, talked with yeah. <laughs> he's coming. Now. You have your name on the patent of the news feed, right? So you are, in some sense, uh, there from the beginning. Um, what would you suggest to a regulator or anybody how to improve the situation? So uh, one thing that uh, YouTube and, and uh, Facebook have in common is that uh, they do select what they send you, and they tend to select in a way that uh, um, is designed to maximize the time you spend on the respective platform. It's not maximized to certainly educate you. It's not even uh, selecting what is uh, the, the best news for you to read. It's just the, new, the news that will keep you there longer. Yeah. So, no? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I'm agreeing with that. So, so w what can we do to, uh, in, in, if you were in charge, you would be the perfect uh, first digital authority person, right? You have experience, you are independent, independently wealthy, so you don't, you're not easily captured. You're like uh, the first commissioner. So you're the first commissioner of the digital authority that Fiona wants to create. What are you going to do about uh, the news feed? Well, I think that exposes my ideological <laughs> opposition to any one person, no, ha no matter how insulated. I mean, but no, but really, mm. I think that that's... Um, I want a competitive market where I have multiple news feeds to choose from. Multiple newspapers, multiple different ways of learning about the world. Some might offer me settings that I can configure. That introduces problems. We should talk about that. Some might offer you know, uh, uh, non-advertising pro products. That introduces problems. But the point is that all, there are pluses and minuses to all of these different configurations. But right now, there is one. And we don't know, really know how it works. By some accounts, if you read the Wired story from a couple weeks ago that was mentioned a couple times today, a lot of folks at Facebook don't know how it works. Um, there, and um, that, to me, is the, the problem. So I don't, have, I don't have a product, a recommendation for how to make the news feed work great. But what I, what I want is to be able to choose. So, so you think that the solution is not in trying to, in any way, regulate that? The, the solution is to try to create more competition? I don't have a sense of how regulation around newsfeed algorithms would work. So, no, I, I, I think that, that more competition is better. You know, and there are some folks who say that competition, more competition, it, and I think Jason said this in the remarks today, um, could be in some industries a race to the bottom. Right, you know, like if it's if there if my friend Tristan talks about the downgrading of humanity, this is Tristan Harris who runs the Center for Humane Technology. Um, I, I don't. I'm, I am more optimistic than uh, than some are on this competition, but the fact is, like, we we don't know, <laughs> you know. So we could talk about that all day, but I'd rather have a competitive market where we can understand what's happening, and if it is actually a race to the bottom, think about digital literacy ed education, civics education, regulation, these things, then to just have one person in control who we are just waiting and hoping makes the right decisions. But in your piece in the New York Times, you do say competition alone will not necessarily spur privacy protection. Right. Regulation is required to ensure accountability. So what regulation do you, have, do you have in mind to ensure that accountability? 
Well, I think that there are good templates. I think um, I was just talking with uh, Ashkan about the California privacy bill that got passed um, last year. I think I'm a little bit more familiar with GDPR. I think that there's a lot there that um, that is that is good. I think that we should have a robust conversation about uh, the way privacy should work. You know, Senator Markey has put forward a privacy bill of rights. Um, I think that there are I uh, know there are experts who do this all day every day and really know uh, all the intricacies. I know some. I know enough to know that we do need some uh, protections. But I think that the point for me in writing the piece was not to give like here's the privacy plan, here's the prescription. It was to you know really create a call for people to say you know, we've been having this debate on the edges, now let's have it in the center and talk about creating the law and an agency to make this happen. And it's so, so that we can move it from the theoretical into an actual pragmatic policy-oriented um, campaign. So I would like to ask you about uh, the proposal that uh, the subcommittee on privacy will release tomorrow, but I don't want to scoop the proposal. So uh, hopefully you're there tomorrow to uh, see and discuss and okay. we'll have another opportunity. Do you want to uh, tease it? <laughs> um, <laughs> so it sounds like you do. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want to uh, scoop uh, uh, Leo and... Uh, okay, I can do it. So, so it's a very Chicago proposal, is to try to uh, shift the default very much in favor of consumers. So allow... Uh, more flexibility than the, the G GDPR, but set all the default in favor of uh, the consumers uh, and uh, monitor that uh, firms don't uh, force uh, a change with what uh, they call, I think this is the new name, uh, dark pattern. Those are annoying requests of change and changing that if you agree with what the company says, they stop, but if you don't, they keep asking you again until you finally say yes. So the, the idea is to not being too interventionist, but set a default that is very much in favor of consumers and being very aggressive in monitoring uh, the uh, attempt by companies to shift the balance through these dark patterns. I like the spirit of that. As long as it comes with real accountability. You know, the teeth, I think, the teeth really matter. I mean, we've seen this with the fine, uh, with, the, with the potential FTC fine of Facebook, I think. You know, when that came down, it was only a couple weeks ago now, well, it technically hasn't come down. When Facebook announced that it was expecting it, which is still perplexing to me. Some, I'm sure that many people in this room know exactly what is happening there, and maybe I can learn from some of you. When Facebook announced that it was, it was happening, uh, you know, I, think I and I think a lot of people are like, whoa, $5 billion. That is historic. That is a... That is a that is a huge amount of money. And um, I immediately opened another tab and went to Yahoo, and it was Yahoo Finance, and, and you saw in the after hours training, the trading, just tick, tick, the stock just going up, up, up. And by the end of the day, the next day, Facebook's market cap had grown by $30 billion, six times the size of the fine. And I think just taking a step back, it's like, that's, that's teeth, at least compared historically to what we've done in the United States and in, and in Europe, for that matter, and it is not even a slap on the wrist for them. It is so, it is so, it is, it, it's so factored in to the price that I think it's a testament to the fact that like fines are either, either you add a zero to it or, or we need to think, uh, and I think we do, and I think it's a, it's a call for us to think about structural remedies to, um, to the problem because even historic fines are just rolling off the, the back. No, I understand, but if that's your metric, uh, this morning we're talking about Standard Oil. When Standard Oil was broken up, the combined price went up. So maybe when Facebook, uh, WhatsApp, uh, and Instagram are broken up, the combined stock price will go up. Would you be sad about that? Well, you're looking at, well, I'm not sure well, two things. First off, I think you, I thought you were saying that after the Standard Oil breakup, the price, the consumer's prices went up. No, no, no. Right. The combined stock prices. Oh, no. Yes, yeah. exactly. If, yeah, if, no, the fact, value, that's what, that, that's, what, that's what consistently happens. You know, Standard Oil, the company's value, when there's competition, 
companies innovate, they get better, they grow. You know, they, it was worth more than what it was worth before. Same thing goes 10 years on from AT&T. Same thing goes uh, in, uh, I, I think it's, it's likely to expect the same thing to happen in a Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp world. I mean, in that world, the three companies would exist independently. The FTC would say, we made a mistake un uh, and unwind the, um, the acquisitions. There would be a CEO of Instagram, CEO of WhatsApp. Mark would likely still be the CEO of Facebook. And they would be competing tenaciously. And so I, I do think that you would see the overall value of that group. And then I think there would be other entrants in the field. It would give Snap an opening. Who knows? You know, it could give LinkedIn, some of the other marginal players in the field an, an opening. And you, I do think you would see more competition. And I think that not only would you, would you were saying, would that be a bad? No, I think that's the point. We want more competition. We want more economic growth. We I want understand more competition, but if you really believe the stock price will jointly go up, why Mark Zuckerberg does not do it by his own, by, by himself? And it's just, if that's a value Good. maximizing action, he will do it. I expect competition to create more value for consumers, but probably to reduce the combined value of the stock prices. Well, help me understand the logic of that, because Mark would have to dive, would separate the three and then himself divest from the other to, to voluntarily. If that makes so, but so much how would money he to, But to he me. wouldn't benefit from that upside post-divestment, right? He will, because instantaneously the price will go up. He would just have the Facebook.com. Imagine that the stock is split into three. And at the moment, at the moment of the, sp uh, the spin-off, he owns all three of them, but then he's, he has to sell two of them. But at the moment, exactly like happened to, to Rockefeller. And, uh, um, you should give him a call. Okay, uh, but let's assume. I mean, I don't. I listen. I think that the. I think every, every minute that we spend talking about how Mark Zuckerberg can fix this problem, is a minute not talking about how Americans and our government need to step up to fix the problem, a and I think that that's what it's been. It's only. It's not even been a week since this article has come out, but I think that we naturally sort of drift back to like, can't can't the private sector just take care of it, and in this case. No, I mean, we could talk about that kind of off-the-wall scenario, but I, I don't think that's no, no, very that, likely. That's not what, where I wanted to go. Where I wanted to go is to recognize that, in my expectation, is if you sort of uh, break up Facebook, uh, you will destroy some stock market value, but that's fine, because that's not the objective of uh, an antitrust authority to maximize the stock price. Uh, if that was the case, we would not have no antitrust. Um, but also, before opening up, because a lot of people want to ask a question, I want to ask one last question. Imagine that my assumption is correct, that you break up and the stock price goes down. If you were still a shareholder of Facebook, will you still be advocating that? Uh, yeah, I think that there are, the, the problems here are so big, socially, culturally, politically, that those are much more important than short-term economic gain from the, the, from holding the stock, yeah. Okay, so with this important answer, uh, Jesse has a first question for you. Yeah, I, I, I can project. Um, uh, well, I'll project from my seat. No, 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 it's coming, it's coming. Oh, here we go. Okay, so uh, I, I really admire the piece that you wrote. I think it takes a, a significant amount of courage to have done it. Um, but I thought I, that it was pretty remarkable that you went to great pains to describe Mark Zuckerberg as a good and decent human being. <laughs> um, and I wonder if, uh, one, if you sincerely believe that. Um, yes. And I think it's a very important thing for Silicon Valley executives to think of themselves as good human beings mm. and to uh, envelop themselves with a sense that they are, they have a mission um, and that they're not just uh, uh, mm -hmm. rapacious capitalists, that they, uh, you know, they're wiring the world or connecting the world. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if it's possible that Mark Zuckerberg or even Sheryl Sandberg are actually not um, good people, fundamentally. <laughs> Um, and and the reason why it's important, uh, rather than, you know, just as a rhetorical issue, is that if we understood their true character, it might be easier to 
actually regulate them and, and not to hope that, as you just said, Mark Zuckerberg will save us from Mark Zuckerberg, but that we could impose some real, real regulation with teeth if we understood him to be actually uh, somebody who is malign in his character. I, I understand your point. I, I just don't think it's true. You know, I was Mark's college roommate. We, were, we, we have been friends. I doubt we'll be friends after this. But um, I don't, I, I, he's, not, he's not malevolent. He's not malicious. I think he's trying his hardest. Even now, he wants power. He wants to build a great company. Uh, you know, he is human in that regard, but he is you know, he's, he's earnest, he's caring, he is, uh, he is, he is, he wants Facebook, I, I genuinely believe that he wants Facebook to be good for the world. And I think he has too much power, and Americans and government need to step up. Those two things, like it's so much easier to write a story if he's evil, or, or to write a story almost in our minds, because then it's like good guy versus, you know, it's, it's good versus bad, it's, you know, Star Wars-esque, and, I, and that isn't my view. And that's, I mean, this is, listen, this is my, people may disagree with me, um, uh, but I think that was a lot of the challenge in writing this for, and, and coming to this position. Personally, it's, you know, I've, I've been working on economic justice issues for several years, worked largely on the guaranteed income and tax policy, and um, one of the biggest things that, that comes up when you talk about that is, well, it doesn't work to give people money if you don't have markets that are dynamic and fair. And as I grew into the antitrust space more and more, I you know, realized how much of my own story was based in Facebook, which was very much a monopoly now. And so coming to wrestling with the, with the reality, in my, my view, the truth of the fact that both Facebook is a monopoly with, you know, that, that, that is, that is uh, problematic for Americans, and Mark's a good person who is, you know, an entrepreneur with hustle who's made mistakes, clearly. I'm not here to defend Mark uh, for those, but he's not, I, I don't see him as a malicious actor, or Cheryl or the, the team there. I think that, you know, I think there may be someone here from Facebook uh, who I think that they're, you know, trying to do their best. Oliver. Just one second. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it seems to me people can change and do so uh, when they acquire great wealth or power. After all, I mean, sure. politicians who become leaders uh, may start off with good. I'm not saying this is the case with Mark Zuckerberg. I know nothing about it. But politicians may have uh, great uh, plans and ideals, and then when they get power, they may act a bit differently. I mean, Lord. Acton, I think it was, who said power corrupts and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. So uh, it seems to me that could reconcile risk, yeah. these two positions. It's definitely a risk. It's not my experience of Mark, but I agree that, I mean, very much people change. I've changed. He's changed. We've, yeah. Sylvia. Yeah, I don't know if you can see me. Okay, but you definitely can hear me. So I really appreciate this the fact that you stress the role of accountability. But I think the first thing to have accountability is to actually inform people of the use that Facebook is doing of their data. And I'm pretty worried about inequality in the level of information and knowledge that people have about this usage of their data. And especially if the people that are more vulnerable to like fake news and like all the negative externalities that like you mentioned before are also the ones that are less likely to be informed about the negative views of their data, this poses a problem. So I would like to know what do you think are, could be strategies to inform people about the issues related to data usages and like uh, how do you think we can, we can try to break this inequality also on this spectrum, given that you're interested in inequality? Yeah, well, I think that the, the you know, information standard right now, these like terms of service agreements, which no one reads, and even if, you know, is bar they're barely penetrable. I mean, a lot of folks have talked for a very long time about how they're, um, you know, just window dressing for, for consent. I think that um, there's, there, ho hopefully we can turn a corner on that and um, put real responsibility on the companies to ensure that, that um, people know how they're 
their data is being used, how it's being collected. People can hopefully have the right to opt out and the right to say, hey, third parties can't use this uh, data. I'm happy to sh tell Uber where my location is, but Uber, you can't package that up and tell Facebook or whatever, you know, other, any other company that I'm here. So I think that like true information informed um, uh, so, so that people understand it is a critical step forward. I will say that, you know, Google, I think, has done quite a bit on this that has been proactive. I think all the companies after GDPR um, have seemed to take that more, more seriously. Um, I would love for it to go even further so that people know exactly how their data is collected, know how it's being used, and hopefully one day have the right to delete it uh, and or prevent other third parties from, uh, from using it. So, uh, I think that's yeah. I think that's I think that's critical, and that's the kind of thing an agency can enforce, just like the CFPB with credit cards, and uh, you know, there there again, there there are templates for um, for how to do this. Maybe not always perfect ones, but um, just putting it in a in a law and saying, okay, we're good to go. Like uh, we need the law, but we also need active enforcement and oversight. Anat. Thank you. Uh, t two quick comments. For one, to kind of go into the you know. Zuckerberg personal qualities or whatever. Um, two other people who've spoken, uh, well, one person in public and one person who have encountered who spoke to uh, you know, Mark and Cheryl. One is uh, Roger McNamee, who were recently uh, hosted at Stanford, where I'm from, um, speaking about that. And also at Stanford, we have Alex Stamos. Again, we're talking about uh, you know, ex-insiders or, uh, or other people. Um, who know Facebook specifically. And um, so Roger McNamee, who's an investor, uh, is criticized, and he did not sell his shares, and he does speak in ways that would reduce uh, the value of his uh, investment, uh, is criticized for being an outsider, and he's not from within, and he doesn't really understand, and all of that. But uh, in that context, we got to meet an algorithmic person who is from within, who was talking about the newsfeed algorithm. He moved there, uh, I'm not gonna reveal his name, he doesn't really wanna speak in public, but he's sort of uh, um, in, in trauma from being there. Uh, and the trauma was that uh, he moved there uh, in 2017 uh, as data uh, person, head of data, um, and uh, tried, wanted to, convey, to try to uh, use other algorithms for the way the newsfeed works that is away from the virality and, and engagement and anger and, and other things, and into trying to balance some of that. And his testimony to this, which he actually, I think, did say in public in the Roger McNamee event, uh, which was videotaped, uh, was that uh, Mark and Cheryl did not want to try these algorithms. Uh, and he got incredibly frustrated after a year and a half I can tell you more about that later. But again, to, to Oliver's point, um, we don't know what kind of self-defense people develop uh, after a while or how they don't want to stick to their narratives or whatever else is you know, psychologically beyond our economists' uh, true understanding of the world. Uh, but it's conceivable that the nice guy you had in college is sure not the same guy that we have today. Just one other point to back to, you, to Luigi's question that tried to press you on the on the details and also to the point that was just made. Uh, people talk about algorithmic transparency. You know, you get very vague when you start talking about the regulations. Uh, one thing that we do see in media companies, uh, in terms of them giving us some handle on what people are seeing, is we just want some data about what does what what clicks, you know, is it the case that a million people, you know, shared that the, you know, Pope endorsed Trump or whatever, you know, other fake news, and that they would reveal just like, you know, most shared or most clicked, you know, the kind of thing New York Times reveals to you about what people actually consume uh, about information. So that would be kind of easy, in other words, to force some disclosures of some information that is relevant to us about about what's going on. Not seeing the algorithms, which we won't know what they do. In other words, just seeing the code, which keeps changing 
uh, according to the algorithmic guy, is not going to change. But what I'm saying is there are the question. things. My question <laughs> is, do you, would, you, would you support uh, you know, going there to regulate the news feed that you've created uh, in some fashion? Uh, what, what, what kinds of things? Give us a little I bit I have more yet to see a pro, uh, uh, an argument that makes the case for that that I think is um, a good idea. So, um, and this is a little bit to the same question yeah. that you were asking before. I think, um, I, I think it's, uh, I'd prefer for competition to be the gauge, to have a half a dozen uh, different news feeds to be able to choose from. I think that transparency, I think, is, I think most everyone in this room would prefer more data from all of these companies to understand what's happening on it. The algorithm, it's sort of like the search algorithm at Google. I keep looking for Hal, but you know, over there. <laughs> uh, he, he's in the, he's blocked for me. You know, it, um, as soon as you, the, as those algorithms become more transparent, it becomes easier to game them and it actually could have um, a huge counter, counter, uh, be, be counterproductive. So, um, uh, so again, I, I think my, my preference is have competition to solve this problem rather than a regulator getting into tweaking Facebook's uh, algorithm for the, for the news feed. Guy. Yeah. Very quick question. Did you learn anything about uh, the Facebook and the news ecosystem from your experience as a publisher? Yeah. Oh, man, a lot. Um, so for those who don't know, I owned a, a magazine called The New Republic for four years. And um, we had a lot of ups and we had some downs. Um, I, um, and I learned a lot from that experience. I mean, the, that was the period when Facebook really went from being a somewhat modest um, source of traffic to by far the most, uh, driving the most traffic to all news websites. And then since then, it's, it's depending on the kind of news site, it's either tapered or, um, or decreased. But um, yeah, we chased Facebook attention all the time. Absolutely, and I will be the first to say that we were doing lots of good long-form journalism, and then you know I was pushing like, how do we make this into the you know the the five takeaways? I mean, you even see you, the New York Times on the piece that I put out last week put out two pieces at the same time. One was six thousand words, and another was the five takeaways where they summarize their own you know my my own piece there. So this still. This still exists, and so again, it's a fine balance between like, well, of course we want more journalism to be more accessible, and there's some people who like bite-sized um, piece of content. We want a video version of a 6,000 word piece because a lot of people prefer video and are gonna actually watch four minutes, five minutes of that rather than the piece. Fine line between saying yes to all of that and then you know optimizing too far for, for, um, for uh, Facebook and the social web. And so if I could go back into the New Republic days, I would do many things differently. Um, one of which would be to set aside any kind of, of um, uh, aspirations for it to be a self-sustaining business, recognize it as a public good, adopt a not-for-profit kind of, of model, and also say, let's pay attention to how much traffic we're getting from Facebook and Twitter, but like, let's go there later. Let's not give a chart beat login or some of the, the analytics software login to everybody. Like, let's know what, what is doing well there, but let's stay focused on what we think is, is quality. Now, that would be a luxury for a not-for-profit kind of orientation, which most news organizations don't have. And so um, I think this is still remains a, a huge tension, obviously, in the, in the field. Julia, behind you, Linda. Thanks. So given that we're talking about newspapers and that uh, a lot of the discussion today was about journalism crisis and also like uh, local newspaper deserts, I have a question. Like, do you think that we should tax Facebook and like Google other platforms to fund journalism? And when I say tax, it's not about like Facebook setting up uh, some fund to pick the newspapers uh, yeah. they want to subsidize, but really to have like some governmental action to tax uh, advertising revenues from Facebook and use this money uh, to fund media outlets? I'd love to learn more about how that would work. Uh, dispositionally, it's the kind of idea I think is really interesting. I think, as I was just sort of alluding to in that answer, I think that um, you know, news is a public good. 
And I think uh, we had a unique period in the post-World War II era for about 40 or 50 years where there, were business mo uh, there was a business model. Even there, I think a lot of us got fooled. I got fooled, at least in, as a student of that period, in thinking that A1, where the real news um, was, uh, was, was written, was you know, a self-sustaining product, not realizing it's the automobile section, it's the travel magazine, it's the style magazine on Sunday that are um, making the, the business model work. Um, so I think in this period, those business models are much harder, and we should you know, confidently say that they may need uh, public subsidies from uh, the not-for-profit sector, I guess in theory from corporations, perhaps government. But the idea of, of um, some kind of, of fund to subsidize that, I think, I, I think is interesting. To tax Facebook to do it, um, you know, if there were a political, enough political interest for it and there was a way that a, a government might be uh, able to do that, I, I don't, I mean, Facebook, I think, has taken millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, a lot of money for that, of advertising revenue from media organizations and now enjoys the benefit of it. So expecting them to give back some of that feels more than reasonable to me. That could be voluntary. I, um, uh, you know, perhaps someone should call for that, I, um, or it could be through regulation. I'm not exactly sure how it would work, but uh, I think it's a promising idea to explore more. I have uh, the question there, no? Yeah, thank you. It was uh, less of a question than just a comment, because I felt that so many people here worry about the character of Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> and um, I think the whole point of the piece is that it doesn't matter. Yeah. It, uh, it doesn't matter if he's a saint or if he's evil. That's the whole point. The whole point is that we shouldn't rely on someone being caring or not. We should have a system, a regulatory system, that can work regardless. So. Yeah, it, it's, it's like a dictatorship that is great when you have a great dictator, but it's very rare. So we have to have a system that is rel reliable when people are not great. <laughs> Al. So I have a question for both of you. Imagine a world where there are two new websites, Republican.feed and Democrat.feed. And they both take the Facebook feed, and one re removes all the material that isn't appropriate for Democrats, and the other removes all the material that isn't appropriate for Republicans. That's the issue. Is that a better world? This is the TV world, right? You have CNN and you have Fox. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm scared of that. The only thing I'm scared more of is using that as an argument for pro-incumbency bias so that we shouldn't choose. It, it's not, I mean, it's not, I share the concern. Yeah, I, I, I do. I think that, um, you know, it, it, um, it could cause our filter bubbles to get worse. Ab absolutely. And that is, that is a real problem. That is, should not also be a justification to give up on competition in industry. I mean, that's like saying, you know, if, if McDonald's was the only uh, fast food restaurant, and it's like, well, competition might, there might be less healthy food elsewhere. It's like, maybe, but, you know, like, we, we can and should deal with that. It's not, that, that shouldn't be the, an argument just to keep the status quo. Sally. Sorry, yeah, I was just going to say, don't we already Wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. <laughs> Don't we already essentially have that with our targeted individual news feed? I mean, we already have not really a public sphere. I get what Facebook's news feed has learned that I want to see, which is progressive content. I don't get Republican content. I mean, isn't this kind of already the status quo? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it largely is, although I think, Hal, I think Hal's correct. I think it's worthwhile to understand that we may think about a world where that could get exacerbated. And we need to prepare for that. We need to think about how to how to manage that. Um, but like that, that I just dispositionally, I think that that as a justification, the world could be worse if we take a if we make markets competitive. It felt, feels awfully like you know AT and T in 1981, you know, saying, well, it's going to get you know, just imagine what your telephone service is going to be like after we get broken broken up. Uh, telephone yeah. works great today. Yeah, yeah, so I'm not, obviously not advocating that world. But the point is, under the existing world, someone else chooses your feed, and yes, they're doing it based on your behavior. Under this world, you do have choice, the world that I'm proposing. And you can imagine it for many, many other groups where you say, no, I want to opt in to receiving this kind of material. 
Now, I have the same feelings you do. That It's a very mixed question of whether that's a better world or not, in my view. In one sense, people have more choice, but in the other sense, uh, they have the filter bubble and they aren't exposed to alternative viewpoints. So it's very unclear to me what the right solution is there in terms of giving you what you want or giving you what you need. Well, I just don't think that one person should be able to decide what I need. And right now, Mark Zuckerberg and the team that reports to him and how the news feed's configured is the one who does. And that's what I think is un-American. Matt Stoller. Hey, um, so actually, I have a question for Hal. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. So this is an article from Wired. In December of 2016, Google announced it had fixed a troubling quirk of its autocomplete feature. When users typed in the phrase, are Jews, Google automatically suggested the question, are Jews evil? How does Google think about the problem of filter bubbles? And I guess that would be a particularly extreme one. So I, haven't, I have not had any uh, specific interaction with that particular problem, although I know uh, at Google, uh, Several of the leaders are Jewish, of course, and they debated this issue uh, seriously because we tend to reflect what the population is saying. So when you look at autocomplete, it's determined by users, not directly by Google, and we try to intervene in that as little as possible. So we actually reached a solution on that uh, problem of basically purchasing an ad which sent people to the Jewish anti, uh, whatever it's called, the Anti-Defamation League, exactly, to, uh, you know, to counteract this. But there's a very great reluctance at Google to try to interfere with what the uh, users are choosing. So you're always going to run up this problem. And I think this comes back to what I was asking about, about this question of who do you want to censor your search results? But, but why were they debating? Person, it could be many people. Okay. What was their debate? Let, let's, uh, let's stop this debate. I think that uh, okay. there is time for an ex extra question or not. Sure. Yes. Can do one more. Uh, pa Patrick. Uh, so, so in March, uh, Mark Zuckerberg announced... Wait, wait, wait. He's uh, coming. In, in March, Mark Zuckerberg announced a relaunch of Facebook's strategy. It w he said it was going to become uh, privacy-focused. There was going to be a single encrypted uh, communications network. Um, what did you, did you make of that? Because the conspiracy theory is the underlying motive is to integrate better Instagram, WhatsApp, and Facebook, and therefore uh, make it harder to, 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 to break the company up. So do you buy that idea that, that Facebook is essentially preparing defenses against what you've recommended? Well, I think, I mean, that's been reported since January, I think they announced that they were um, combining the back ends of when Instagram, WhatsApp, and um, uh, Facebook, which, by the way, they promised they would not do when acquiring WhatsApp. And um, now they've announced that they're doing that. And so I think that that is, I'm sure there are, pro there, there are product reasons to do that. It's better for them to have more data on people and to have that in a consolidated place. I think it's also clear that it makes it, it makes it more difficult, although not impossible, for regulators to unwind those acquisitions. Um, I think that that is you know, related to, but a bit distinct from the, the, the new emphasis on privacy and encryption. My read on that is that that's a really interesting move because on the one hand, um, you know, it's hard to argue with, uh, with it sounds like more end-to-end -end encryption, users are secure, isn't that what everyone's saying that they want? On the other hand, I think symbolically, it's, um, I read it as um, uh, throwing in the towel on, on, on um, trying to, to figure out how to make Facebook's, whether it's the newsfeed algorithm or, or other pieces of the platform, civil. You know, it's, um, you know, and this is, this is, I haven't spoken to him, but, you know, this is the, at least the public reporting around why Chris Cox, the, the head of product, left, because it's effectively saying, you know, we just, we can't handle it, so we're, we're gonna, we're gonna give up, you know, like, we can't be, we, if it's encrypted and, and, and if ISIS is using it to communicate with one another, we don't see it, we can't do anything about it. Um, so, I, I think it's, um, 
I think it's a, the timing of the move is really is is really interesting. How it plays out and and how it will shape all of these conversations about Facebook's responsibility is is unclear to me. Um, but I do think that they're trying to integrate the back ends of those three for product reasons and also for competition reasons. Again, I think there's someone from Facebook here who uh, could speak to that probably with much more internal and timely knowledge than I could. Though. Thank you very much for all your time. Thank you. Thank you, guys.